terminology. So here's this cursor thing. We know now that this cursor thing is really playing the role of the iterator. So what we can do here is we can say implements iterator for whatever kind of thing that we're storing. And I think I probably have to remove it from here. Okay. And do the import for iterator and we have something that sort of looks like that. We're going to have to do some fixes here. Um, in order to be an official iterator, you have to do remove. So we'll add in a remove uh, and uh, the remove is going to do nothing. Okay. Now, there's this idea that you can say, hey, I meet the standard, and then you can turn around and go, yeah, I don't feel like doing this part. Okay. We could put something in there. We could put in some sort of error thing. We could throw an exception or something to really warn people. But for our purposes, we're just going to ignore this thing and not worry about any sort of error. Okay. So we're still left with basically what we had before, but now this thing is officially an iterator. Okay, so now the, the next thing that's left is we have to deal with, with this uh, cursor beastie. Uh, yeah, yeah, we'll just ignore that for a moment. And we'll go up here and we'll say not only do we do generic list, but we also do iterable for those types of things. And iterable is the one that says you need to write a method that will give you back one of those iterator beasties. So we can go down to the cursor thing here. And instead of calling this get cursor, we can call it the silly iterator thing, which is that. Okay, And now I have to remember how to fix some of the, uh, the nastiness here. I think I can probably even leave that one off. Just try that. Uh, there's a little work in getting these these uh, these E-type things all set up. There we go. Um, because this one is basically the same thing as up there. And what the compiler was complaining about is that if I make a new one down here, it looks like it's a different kind of thing right, a student versus a worker, and they have to match. So now the E's are consistent all the way through the entire piece of code. And if I'm lucky, I can remove that cast that I had to add in yesterday, because now it should know. There we go. All right. And we'll go into the driver that we had, and the change that we make in the driver is it's still the same piece of code, but rather than me having to worry about the fact that it's actually one of those nasty things like that, I can use the standard one, which is an iterator for worker that does call the iterator method. And do the import statement for that. Okay. And there's the standard iterator code. Okay. But now that it's a standard iterator, the advantage you get of standard iterator is that the compiler knows how to do a for each with an iterator. So now you can write for worker, spell it, who in union just do that line. Okay? So, working backwards, in order to do a for each, the compiler needs an iterator. When you write this code, the compiler actually writes that code for you. So you need the ability to talk to whatever container you've got to ask it for one of those things. And then the thing that you ask for has to be able to do basically a has next and a next in order to wind its way through all the things. Okay. 
So what's the difference in efficiency between these two? This one's big O what? That's N squared because we're restarting for everything that every time you go through this loop, there's an inner loop that starts at the beginning and goes through the chain. So this one's more or less N squared, but as soon as you use the iterator, this for each is order N. Okay? So the real big deal about iterators is not only do you get something that's a lot easier to program and contains less errors because it's not a counted loop, but if the iterator can, it will find a more efficient way to go through the items that you could do yourself. So an iterator for an array list doesn't really buy you a lot in terms of efficiency, but an iterator for a linked list buys you an awful lot in terms of efficiency. Okay. By the way, the only promise that an iterator really makes is that if you keep asking, it will eventually give you everything. Officially, iterators don't promise anything about the order that they will give things back to you, although we often assume that it will have a particular order. Okay? So in Comp 132, we spent a lot of time making sure that lists came out in a particular sorted order. Iterators don't officially guarantee that. Okay, questions about link lists? Iterators. Okay, so with that done, we now have base two basic techniques for storing things. We can either store things in an array where everything's adjacent to each other, and we use positional notation in order to find things, or we can put things on a linked list via a chain and store things not necessarily together and you have to follow the chain in order to find things. Okay? In computer science, those are the two basic ways of storing things. Why do we need another remove? Um, oh yeah, there's, there's a good question. There's two removes in this code. There's the remove for uh, the positional notation and the iterator also has a remove. Okay. Um, there's a special rule for iterators. Uh, if I'm working my way through the students as an iterator, as a secretary, and I get halfway through and all of a sudden somebody starts turfing people from the class or people start leaving, What's an iterator supposed to do? You know, if things start disappearing in front of me, you know, as I'm going along and people are trying to get all of the students out of here, or if people start disappearing behind me, where I've already said to somebody, well, here's a person, and now they're no longer in the class, what do you do? Carry on. You could just carry on, but all of a sudden you could say to somebody, yes, there's somebody else, and in the meantime, while you're standing here waiting, somebody removes the somebody else. Oops, you know, you just promised that there was somebody else, but now they're gone, right? Been replaced, they disappeared from the class, okay? So the issue with iterators is the rule is, is that when an iterator is moving through the room, you're not allowed to use the regular remove in order to remove people because that would mean that the iterator would be placed in a difficult position. Okay? And so Java iterators, if you try to remove something while an iterator is going through with the regular remove, you get uh, an exception. Your program dies. Okay? The iterator says, no, I'm not having any of this and your program will die. Adding things onto the end though is fine? No. Okay. Can't change it at all. The rule is, and it's, I can't remember the name of the exception, but it's literally something like, you know, state changed exception or something like that that says, that says no, 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 you can't do this. Okay? So the rule is, is that now what you do is you build in a remove into the iterator so that the iterator is, since it's the one in charge, 
the rule is, and if I'm standing over here and somebody said, okay, who's, who's that person? The rule is the iterator is allowed to remove that one that they're standing over. So that's why the iterator's remove doesn't take any arguments because it's the current one, which is really the one it just gave back or the one that's actually the one it's standing over next. Okay? And because the iterator is standing over top of that one, the iterator may find a more efficient way to actually remove them. So if I'm standing here trying to remove this person and that's the person that's next, I may be able to easily connect him to him because I happen to be standing right there anyway. Okay? So if I go get the one before and the one after, and I have a link to the one before, I can do a reconnection on the spot, remove that person and keep going, and life is good for me. Okay? So two different removes on purpose. This remove, the reason I didn't write the remove in, uh, in this iterator class is that what we've got is a singly linked chain. So it's actually difficult if I'm standing here to go backwards to him in order to do the, the join of the previous guy to the next guy. Okay? Because the only way I can get to the previous guy is for me to wind back through the start again. But if I were to provide myself with both forward and backward links, which is called a doubly linked list, <coughs> where you tie people in both directions, then if I'm standing at him and somebody says remove him, it's like I can go backwards easily to him, I can link him to the next one and then he's gone. Right. So there's this idea that the iterators, because they're basically inside the room rather than outside, have the ability to play some sneaky games in order to get the work done. How would you implement uh, in the in the array list code that we have, our object list we called it, what would the iterator look like for object list? Remember that's the one that's array based, so it's using positional notation. What would you have here instead of node? Just an integer? Just an integer, just a number. So this is the now serving idea, right? Now serving number zero. So all that the iterator does is it just stands there and it remembers, oh, you want the zero position of the array. When somebody comes along and says, got anything for me? It looks at position zero, it goes, why well, yes, there's something there, it's not empty, okay. Here, you can have the position zero person. And then all that they do is they bump up the number to say, I'm gonna stand over top of the next person who happens to be immediately adjacent to the one they just gave. So it's just a simple number now serving. So an iterator for an array list really just hides the, that count that you would have done with a counted loop. It stuffs it inside. Okay. And it keeps track of the count for you. And now all of a sudden you can see that. Okay. So it's just a number. This is hiding the integer. Okay. But the good promise of the iterator is that it just goes through all the stuff. You don't have to worry about first. You don't have to worry about getting the last one right. You just keep asking for more until it says there aren't any more. Okay, so now we've got two different techniques for storing things. Every other variation that we're gonna see throughout the rest of the term is just one of those two things. Okay. In sometimes various weird concoctions. Okay, so let's leave those two ideas and let's move on to something new. Uh, in last term, you learned, I think, what a stack was. So somebody give me an example of a stack. A real life example. Yeah, not how it works, but just an example of something that constitutes a stack. Stack of books. I always think of, a, of, of the newspaper recycle bin as being a stack because every day you throw on the most current newspaper and most of the time all that you want is today's newspaper off the top of the pile. If you have to go dig underneath, it's like, okay, we'll make another pile beside it and we'll dig, dig, dig in reverse until we get to the one that we want. 
So there's this idea that you can only remove the topmost one from the pile, and the bottom of the pile is, is uh, uh, the oldest one. Okay? Where's the stack in football? The easiest one. <laughs> somebody gets tackled, somebody goes down on top of them, somebody goes down on top of them, somebody goes down on top of them. Dog pile. It's just a dog pile. <coughs> and when people come off the pile, they generally come off in the reverse order that they were added on until the poor last person who hit the ground first is the one who comes back off the pile last. Okay, the most stale person of the lot, the crushed one. Okay. Uh, the one that they use in textbooks, every textbook you ever see, they use the, the cafeteria plate stacker idea. You know, you put the plate on and the plate, <coughs> move, plates move down so that it's always, there's always those old ones at the top. Same thing happens in your kitchen cupboard, probably. You take off the topmost plate, put it back on. You rarely use the one at the bottom. Pez dispenser. Perfect, right? comes pre-filled stack and you only eject the topmost one. There's no way that you can get to the oldest, stalest candies at the bottom without going through all of them. Okay, lots of examples. Um, where's the, uh, where's the stack? Oh look, there's a stack there. When you hit the back button, you get whatever the least stale one was until you work your way back sometime towards the beginning of time whenever you started things. What's the forward button? So what you've got is you do something like, we'll call this one the top of this pile is current. So you go and you say, I want to see CNN, right? And then you type in another web page like Sports Illustrated, and all of a sudden this one stays underneath the pile. So the one at the top is always the URL that's showing in, in the middle. What happens when you hit the back button? Sports Illustrated gets put under the forward button, this one gets erased, and that one becomes the current. So all that it's really doing is it's just moving things between two stacks, forward and back, as you go. Okay. So notice that people are actually naturally used to using the stack idea. It's a really sort of common thing, and people just naturally go, okay, forward, back, yeah, I got it, no big deal. Some stacks are really restrictive. Some stacks only say that you can look at the topmost one. Okay? Other stacks say if you want to, you can go peek through. Okay? And in particular, it's not unusual to peek through without changing things. So here's a question for you. If you're a GUI writer, and somebody hits the back button and goes down like that, how do you get all those things without changing the stack? How do you print them all out? What piece of, what kind of thing in your code is doing that? That's an iterator, right? As soon as you press the back button, you need a list of all of the stuff that's in the stack from front to back. And so all the iterator does is it just goes through and it gives you all of those things one by one by one until they're all nicely filled out there, but it doesn't change them. Okay? So there's your iterator in action. That's why you need one. Okay? Didn't have to remove anything. It just goes and lets you see all of the ones that are there. Okay, so you run a for each in order to see them all, and you get them from newest to oldest. Okay, um, one more. Where's the stack there? 
give you a hint. Oops, made a mistake. Well, there's actually two, but let's do the mistake one first on the buttons. Undo is a stack, right? So every time you hit Control Z or do the, the edit undo, notice here that the undo only allows me to undo the very last thing. What does it do if I want to redo it? It's put the undo stuff onto a redo stack so that then if you say redo, you go back in the other direction. So it's exactly the same concept for, for undo and redo. There's two stacks sitting there. Okay. Um, the other stack. There's, there's the stack trace, right? So if we've got a, uh, a breakpoint, I guess, anywhere here, let's make sure I've got one someplace. I can get it in there. Oops, wrong place. There we go. Uh, and I run with the debugger. Yeah, do it the easy way. There's the stack, right? So the newest thing is at the top, and the oldest thing is at the bottom, and when you return from that method, you go back to the one that called it. Okay? And you can only go back to the one that called it, you can't go back to something in between. So there's a restrictive version of a, of a stack, nicely called a stack trace. Okay? And so when you run off the end of that brace, the way that we know to get back to whoever called it is it's that one, okay? So, notice the words that I used, get back to where I was, right? One of the reasons for using a stack is that anytime that you have a problem where the words in your head is, I want to go back to something I had previously, then chances are pretty good the stack is a good tool for solving that sort of problem. Okay? So, you can write stacks yourself arbitrarily without calling them a stack and just say, okay, I'm going to use an array and I'm always going to use the last position, et cetera, et cetera. But the problem with that is that if you don't call it a stack, people have to figure out that it's a stack. Okay? So one of the reasons for writing a stack class, like we're going to do, is not because it's all that difficult to write, but because if we call it that, people have some sense of how we're going to use the thing and the type of problem that we're going to solve. Okay? So just those words have some sort of meaning for the type of problem. Okay, so let's uh, start a brand new project. Get rid of this one. And we're going to do a, a stack implementations in more than one way, just for the pure fun of it. So, okay, let's start out and think of all the things a stack should do. Okay, so this is the interface. So what types of things do you expect to be able to say to a stack? Push. Push. Pop. So this is public void push. What kind of thing are you going to push? Objects. Some sort of thing. We have to describe what kind of thing it could be. E is just a variable that means any old thing in this case. And so we'll put the E up there to say it could be a worker, could be a student, could be a whatever, but we're going to be consistent in always using that idea. So there's push. What else you got? And that is going to give back a whatever type of thing. Anything else? Peak. Peak. What if you don't have peak? What do you have to do? You have to uh, pop everything in the list. 
you have to basically hold on to something, right? You have to pop it off, have a look at it, push it back on, which gets sort of annoying. So peak just allows you to look at the topmost one. And notice the topmost one is sort of useful because if you think of that idea that we had here with doing looking at the last URL, we can always peek at the topmost of the backwards stack and that's the current thing. Okay, so you don't have to have a current variable. You can just say the most current one is always the top of one of those stacks. Okay, so peak is a really handy operation. Anything else? Eh, probably good enough. Okay, we could do iterator in there, implements iterable, etc. So stack is really not particularly smart. And by the way, stack is really just a restriction on a list. You've still got the list of stuff, but I'm only allowing you to look at a very specific one in the list all of the time. Okay, well, if that's our uh, stack interface, uh, let's write a uh, stack class. And I'm going to use a stack with an array underneath it. And I'm going to say implements stack interface for E type things. And now <coughs> we're going to get the complaint that we don't do those things. So we'll just get them added in there. Okay. What should I do next? Trick question. Write the unit tests. Okay. So I've got something that pretends to be a stack. Rather than worry about whether it works or not, I'm going to move right to doing uh, unit tests. So let's make a unit test that tests stack array. We'll add the setup method just in case we need it put in the uh, JUnit libraries, all set to go. Uh, I need some uh, fodder in order to be able to put onto the stack. Doesn't really matter what. So let's steal a uh, worker from here for whatever reason and throw this into the uh, stack class. Okay. So now we can uh, go into our test case and uh, let's just write, check to see whether or not it was initialized properly. Oops. So I'd make a new stack. And uh, the stack is specifically going to be for workers. And this is stack array of worker. How would I know whether or not it was initialized properly? What do I, what question can I ask the stack to find out about things about it? Yeah, you could try to peek to see if it's anything there, but remember officially there has to be something there before you can peek. So you're only allowed to peek if there's something there, just like you're only allowed to pop if there's actually something there. And the big problem is we don't know. Okay. So the issue is is that there's actually something missing from our interface. How would you, what other information do you need to know? The size will tell you whether or not there's something there. Okay. Okay. So one of the things that happens with people that write interfaces is that you have to be really careful when you make a standard that it's got all of the stuff that the standard needs. And so one of the advantages of doing the unit tests is that it automatically, when you go to test it, you go, oh, this thing isn't going to work. 
Okay, I don't, I'm not getting enough information, so we have to change the standard. Okay, you really hate to change the standard after you've shifted out to a whole bunch of people and said this is the standard and have to come up with a revision, they'll get really annoyed. So we're lucky we caught it at this point. So now that means this thing is now missing the size method. And so right away, uh, well, okay, we'll just, I'm not gonna play with that one yet. We can say, I think that stack.size should be empty. Okay, how about another test? What should we do next? Do the simplest thing, which is push one. So if we do a uh, make a new stack, and we do a stack dot push somebody. We need to make a worker object. Let's start putting some worker fodder up here. Does it matter what sort of stuff I put in here for names or whatever? Be and uh, so as long as you can keep track of which is which, and the way I'm going to keep track of which and which is not by the stuff inside them, but by the fact that they have a unique address. Okay? So we're never going to use equals to compare things. We're always going to use double equals to make sure we get the exact one that we put on. Okay? So now we can push somebody on to the stack. And what should you know at this point? size is now going to be one so we'll stuff that in there change it to a one what we should, should also be able to peak so so if we peak we should be getting a worker as the thing on the stack. Mm -hmm. While we're here, we might as well push or pop it. And then I think that first had better still be a worker. Got it. So that's actually push and pop. One. Let's do one more, just so that we have some reasonable amount of testing here. I'm going to steal this one. And I'm going to do two. So I'll need more fodder. And just so I don't get confused when I see them in the debugger, I'm going to do that. And then we'll go down and we'll say, let's see, we can push a worker. Let's just do a B worker. Size should now be 2. And if we look at the top, we should have B worker rather than A. And if we do a pop, we should get B worker first. And then the next guy that we should get, we're using the same variable, should be A. Does the test look right?
better be because otherwise we'll be in trouble when we start debugging. That's good enough. I would actually probably do three just for the fun of it because that gives me a beginning, middle, end. But I'll write that one later so I don't have to bore you with it. Okay, so now it's time to do the work of actually making a stack. So I said we'd store a stack in an array. So there's an array of items. We need a constructor. We need to initialize all items. Um, new E array. Pick a size. What doesn't it like about that? Remember? It's this weird nastiness in Java. Java won't let it be an E type thing. The only thing that you can put there is an object array of general things, and now it complains that, oh, you made an object array, you can't use it for workers. So the answer to that is to do, no, damn it, it's really a worker array is what I intend on using it for. Uh, a new, sorry, E array. Okay, so that's just a little weird Java stupidity that comes from them adding the generic stuff later. Okay, we'll mark this as private. Um, keep track of the size or not? Mm, maybe, we'll find out. Let's do uh, push. Suppose somebody says push, where are you going to put it? Sub some position gets holds on to that thing. So that becomes next free. Oops. Next free to fill. So we'll need to keep next free to fill. And we'll need to set it to zero. We can use control space. So next free to fill, and then next free to fill goes up by one. How about when somebody says pop? Oh, there's that nasty little trap, right? You're going to try to do this. Return all items sub next free to fill minus one. And then you have to drop next free to fill by one, but you can't do that after the return no, statement. E item equals all items next free to fill. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so remember the, the little the little Pfeiffer trick here is when whenever you see a piece of code where you're supposed to return something, the best thing to do is make a variable that identifies what you want to return first. So the item I'm interested in is all items at next free to fill minus one, which is the last filled slot. And even here, you know, if you want to remind yourself, I know it seems sort of silly, but it makes it just a little more obvious. It's next free to fill, by the way. Uh, I'll get there. Okay. 
and uh, then you can uh, decrement next for to fill like you're supposed to do and then we'll just return the thing that we were interested in and then next free to fill is now an empty slot so all items sub next free to fill needs to be set to null. Does that code look familiar? Do you feel like we're doing the same thing all over again? Yeah. What happens if you run out of stack space? Or, or what happens if you run out of space here? What are you going to have to write? Stand. Something that grows the stack. Now traditionally in, in most programming, stacks don't grow. They're sort of a fixed size and it never changes unless you restart the program. So we probably wouldn't do grow here. We'd probably provide a parameter to say here's the maximum size. But still, we're going to write the same code all over again. Is there a shortcut we could take using other code we already have? Remember, we've got uh, we've got our generic list or member li or sorry our chain list code, for instance, or we've got the code that we used for object list, and those ones already keep things for us. So if we reused one of those, for instance, think of Java array list. Really what it is is it's a array list with a restriction that you can only look at the last item on the, of the array. You can only add one to the end, you can only look at the last one, and when you say remove, it gives you back the last one from the end. Okay? So there's gonna, we're actually going to implement this stack in three ways, which is why I wrote the, uh, uh, the unit test for it. We're going to see if this works for an array underneath. We're going to write it with linked list code underneath so that you can get used to using more of linked list stuff. And then we'll take the easy way and we'll layer it over top of something like array list or code that we've already written to do it in another way. So lots of different ways to write a stack, but we'll run through them really quickly tomorrow. See you in the lab. <laughs>